Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Selim Tezel, and I'm a member of the MIT App Inventor Education team. Uh, you can see my email address there, stezel at mit.edu. And uh, the slides for this presentation are at that bit.ly address that you see uh, below. Uh, and I shared also the video of this presentation with the organizers that you should be able to uh, also have uh, after the conference. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with MIT App Inventor. Uh, MIT App Inventor is an app creation environment uh, and it is completely visual. So I wanna quickly give you a brief uh, outline what it looks like uh, in case you have not seen it before. Uh, if you look at this left side, that's where uh, we have the components palette, where all the components you would need in an app, such as buttons, text box, password, text box, et cetera, uh, you can drop and drag into the viewer. And uh, as you uh, drop these uh, components, you can see the app being built in real time in the viewer. Uh, right next to that, you see a components hierarchy where the uh, relationship of the components with each, with each other is displayed. And at the very right, you see that um, the properties of the components can be changed. Now, when you click at this uh, blocks button, uh, you come to the coding environment and the coding environment is completely uh, block based. Uh, it's basically like puzzle pieces fitting together. Uh, and it's really uh, almost impossible to make any kind of a syntax error, which is a, a wonderful news for uh, beginning uh, programmers. Now, uh, you can access all the tutorials that I'm going to be mentioning in a minute uh, on our web page, uh, on the front page, uh, appinventor.mit.edu. If you scroll towards the middle of the page, there's a section called Artificial Intelligence with App Inventor, and all of our uh, current uh, tutorials are uh, there, and we're gonna put uh, more stuff in there uh, in the coming months. Now, our tutorials and projects are uh, roughly categorized into two groups. The first group is called uh, rule-based AI projects. You can also think of this as classical AI projects. And the second group is uh, machine learning-based AI projects. Now, for the rule-based AI projects, the first project we have is called the Therapist Bot. Uh, it is inspired by our collaborators, YR Media, formerly known as Youth Radio. They had an article called, Could Your Next Therapist Be Your Phone? Um, and it is based on MIT Professor Weizenbaum's ELISA project from the 1960s. You may have heard of that. Uh, uh, it basically uses what is called Carl Rogers' non-directive psychotherapy, where the, uh, the therapist, or bot in this case, uh, never directs the conversation, but asks guide, guided questions. Uh, here's an example. So let's say in the therapy session, the user says something like, uh, I love my sister. Uh, all that the bot does is it starts with a qualifier, like, can you explain why? And then the first person is replaced with second person, I become you, my become your. So can you explain why you always loved your sister? So as you can see, it's just basically a bunch of questions that uh, uh, guide the conversation. Uh, this is the first uh, tutorial in which we introduce uh, uh, the uh, data structure, the dictionary data structures in MIT App Inventor. Uh, you can see here the first uh, person, uh, uh, I, me, my, etc., to be replaced with you, you, yours, etc. And uh, uh, this is uh, how you're able to have the bot respond uh, to the uh, user's uh, comments. The next project is called Voice Calculator. Um, it is uh, basically uh, when the app is finished, uh, you can ask the uh, the, the app, uh, you know, in spoken language, some mathematical question like, you know, what is 72 times 51? And the app will parse this sentence and uh, figure out that there are some numbers in there, figure out what the intent is, and respond again in spoken language, uh, the result. In this case, it's the product is 70, 37, 23, et cetera. So it's our introduction to conversational AI agents like Alexa and Siri. You know, how do they interpret what you're saying? How do they uh, grasp your intent? How do they respond to you? And how do you build 
uh, what are called uh, voice user interfaces. This is our first introduction to that. Uh, here you see uh, some of the blocks. I don't know if everything is uh, visible, but uh, it basically shows how the sentences will be parsed to decipher important information. Uh, the next project is called Rock, Paper, Scissors with AI. Uh, it is uh, basically using the context of one of the simplest uh, children's games, Rock, Paper, Scissors, uh, to create a, a program where the machine observes and learns from the user's game choices. Uh, it uses what is called the Markov model. If you look at this uh, bottom right part here, you'll see what is called the Markov transi transition matrix. And uh, it keeps track of the user's uh, behavior and uh, learns how to beat uh, the user. Uh, it's an early example of what is called these days the re uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, very briefly, so this is what the Markov matrix looks like. For example, this 13 says that 13 times in the game so far, rock was followed by paper. So when the machine keeps track of this, and if a rock is played by the user previously, it's most likely that paper is going to be played next. So the machine will say scissors to be able to beat the user. It's a little uh, you know, clever uh, scheme uh, to keep track of the user's uh, movements. Now, for machine uh, learning-based AI projects, uh, the first project we have is called uh, Im Image Classification with uh, Look Extension. This is our introduction to machine learning. Uh, the look extension basically classifies objects. So when everything is said and done, you have built an app on your mobile device, you hold the device towards an object like a pencil or a bottle, et cetera. Uh, it recognizes what the objects and it, it, it object is and it reports. It's based on a model that is already trained from 1,000 objects from Google's uh, mobile net. Uh, unfortunately, it's not terribly accurate. If it encounters an object it has not seen before, it will give a, you know, obviously a wrong answer. But this is our introduction to, uh, you know, the concept of bias in uh, AI. Uh, this is the first time students uh, see that. The second uh, project in this group is a personal image classifier, or PIC for short. Uh, it is inspired by Google's Teachable Machine, uh, and students train their own model. In the previous example, uh, the model was already trained for them, but in this case, uh, using a browser, uh, the students trained the uh, model. Here you see me uh, classifying three uh, facial expressions, happy, sad, surprise. Uh, I, I give enough you know, uh, you know, captured images, then you train uh, the model, and when the training is done, you can test if the model is successful, uh, uh, again, in the browser, and when you're ready, uh, you import that to the App Inventor environment. And in this project, uh, the, 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 the students create an app that uh, asks the user to match certain facial expressions, happy, sad, et cetera, and gain points. Uh, this is one of our first introduction to the concept of confidence levels. And again, uh, continue our discussion uh, about bias in AI. Uh, the next part- I'm in a warning, I'm in a warning, sorry. Thank you. Uh, personal audio classifier is practically identical interface to the personal image classifier, uh, but you train audio clips, uh, and the audio clips are um, uh, turned into spectrograms, which are basically visual representation of the audio clips. And then the students train their models, and as a project, they create an app uh, for a secret diary that opens only to the user's voice. If somebody else tried to open that diary, uh, it will refuse to open. Uh, the next one is uh, PoseNet and uh, Dancing with AI. Uh, we use Google's PoseNet technology to detect, track key points of the body, wrists, elbows, etc. And you construct uh, during the project a skeletal representation of the body. And then uh, we quantify some very, very basic dance moves, like uh, you know, having the hands in the air and knee up in the air, et cetera. And the app recognizes these moves and adds points to the score of the dancer. It's a fun uh, interactive project. Now, very quickly, future project possibilities. We have in the pipeline a face mesh project, uh, very similar to PoseNet, but this time you track key points of the face. 
uh, and you create Instagram like face filters. So a, a master student is working on that. Uh, we have uh, a, a future project uh, in the pipeline, conversational AI and Amazon Alexa. Uh, we interface with Amazon Alexa and uh, you create apps uh, that use user uh, voice interfaces and uh, also um, uh, conversational AI. Uh, and, and we are hoping that this will uh, lead to a big uh, collaboration with Amazon. Uh, finally, this is one of my uh, projects that I'm really hoping happens. Uh, it's the uh, GAN style uh, transfer app. Uh, here you see the Stata Center MIT, the picture of it. Uh, you give the uh, machine a, an art uh, of a, a, an artist like Picasso. And I don't know if everybody can see, but uh, on the side, you can see the uh, Stata Center recreated in the image of uh, uh, sorry, in the style of uh, Picasso. It, it could be a very fun app for people to develop. Okay, uh, now, uh, basically, uh, we are open to ideas uh, from people. We are constantly communicating with teachers what they want to see. If you have any ideas, please, uh, uh, you know, you are welcome to uh, write me at the email address that I have shared there. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, try to respond. You mentioned that that was block-based programming. Um, can you view it um, not block-based? In other words, can you switch your view? Uh, there is some effort to convert App Inventor to text-based, uh, you know, some version of a text-based mm -hmm. language. It's very much in the beginning, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the aim is really to keep it as simple as possible for children. But uh, there are some efforts, you know, if they're transitioning to text-based languages uh, in the future, they might be able to see some uh, text uh, version of that. But that's very much in the beginning phases. Sure, I understand. Um, I teach um, Exploring Computer Science and AP Computer Science Principles, or I did teach those. Um, and uh, we primarily used code.org. Um, with code.org, you know, they, you know, you kind of have your choice as far as when you're creating apps um, with the block-based programming and you can switch it to, and I had some students that prefer text-based and then some that prefer block-based. I, I like block-based myself because I'm like you, the building aspect of it. And for younger students, that makes, you know, it makes a whole lot of sense. Some people like that other visual. So that was the reason I was asking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a one minute warning and I would like to um, ask um, Jay to start um, sharing her screen with them. Okay, I'll stop the share. And well, but we still have time for finishing um, more questions. You get that more questions. So I have a question. Have um, have you guys deployed that um, curriculum? Have students started using it already or not yet? We started using. We we have these on our website, and uh, we have collaborators across the United States and the, a lot of parts of the world. And uh, these are you know individual teachers here and there. Uh, we don't have uh, a, a, the full curriculum, uh, you know, chiseled out specifically, you know, for a whole year or anything like that, but we're getting there. We're about to have enough, I think, to cover a, a, a good semester's maybe uh, worth of work. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so now uh, we have um, Jay Shao and she will be talking to, oh, and Carolyn Rose, and she's, they're going to be talking to us about the narrative modeling with StoryQ. So please take it away. All right. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, it is a great honor to be here with you all uh, to chat about AI education. My name is Jay Chow. I'm a learning scientist and a Concord consortium. Uh, I have spent many years developing approaches to introduce emerging topics to K-12 classrooms. Uh, having worked with so many teachers, the number one question they have about anything new is, where does it fit in the existing curriculum? Uh, in this case, we're talking about AI. They will ask, isn't that a CS topic? Uh, I'm teaching English. I'm teaching math. Is it relevant for, my, for, for me and my students? Well, we will present approach that integrates 
language arts, mathematics, and computing. And I hope you see how teachers across departments may partner together under this umbrella to create an interdisciplinary experiences for their students. And this approach is a core idea of our new NSF funded project called Narrative Modeling with StoreQ. Our goal is to create a curriculum and a supporting technology to engage middle school and high school students in hands-on work with and critical thinking about artificial intelligence. This is our wonderful team. Uh, we have experts in applied machine learning and text mining from the School of CS and the Carnegie Mellon University, educational researchers from the Learning Design and Technology Program in the North Carolina State, and the Learning Scientists and the Technology Designers in the Concord Consortium. And we engaged students and teachers from three schools in Massachusetts as active co-designers and advisors to support our process. Our work builds on a very strong record of educational innovations. On the left is the Common Online Data Analysis Platform, or CODAP, developed by the Concord Consortium to support data science education for young learners. Uh, it has a very novice-friendly user interface, and you can see the multiple representations of data. They are dynamically linked to help students to develop uh, data fluency. On the right side is a light site developed by CMU. It is a text mining and a machine learning tool bench uh, designed for both practitioners and educators. It provides an open source GUI environment to reify the development process that highlights the insights of developers as they set up, troubleshoot, and iteratively uh, improve their models. And we draw from Dr. Rose's 15 years of experiences teaching applied machine learning to hundreds of university students who are from many disciplines without much background in CS and advanced math. And she has pioneered many strategies and the techniques to make machine learning concepts accessible for this audience. Our human-centered curriculum will focus on helping students understand the role and the responsibilities of developers in the process of AI technology development. And we have this message, the process of a machine learning model development involves hard choices and compromises to achieve what will always be imperfect performance. These hard choices occur at every stage, uh, including selecting data, designing and extracting features, feeding these into the learning algorithms and design, um, and, and then troubleshooting and then iteratively improve the model. The resulting AI will always be, you know, very much what we make it. Our research is to develop a way to communicate this message in an authentic but accessible way. And to delve into those hard choices, we're focusing on machine learning applied to unstructured data with text being our example. Text mining has many applications that touch students' life each day, like search engines, email spam filter, writing assistant, plagiarism, screening. Uh, our goal is to raise their awareness of the role humans play in making these useful but followable technologies. You'll see text not just as in monolithic walls of meanings, but view them more as these features such as words and phrases, regular expressions that capture varying amounts of meanings and what kind of generalizations they can enable and their potential to confuse a machine learning model. As they design these features, train and troubleshoot their models with them, they will explore these trade-offs and hard choices in a very tangible way. And to connect to this with existing curriculum, we're working closely with teachers to find opportunities in their classes to highlight how text mining can be used. For example, to understand how authors use features of language to illustrate social processing over time. One example we have explored is the novel To Kill Not Mockingbird, a very popular text in English class. One big theme in this book is coming of age. Scout, uh, the main character throughout the book, had learned many lessons and changed her views on the people around her. For instance, her feelings towards Calpurnia, um, the, the housekeeper, was pretty negative in the beginning. And she saw her as a tyrannical presence. But later on, through various events, she started to see Calpurnia as protective and uh, brave and more like a mother, mother figure to her. 
and her tones when describing uh, Calpurnia also became more and more positive. In a typical English lesson, students would manually select some of these textual evidence and describe their impressions from their memory. But where hundreds, you know, there are hundreds of excerpts that involve Calpurnia. And as text mining student can train the model and classify their writer's tones around this particular character and map them over the plot and the timeline to get a very comprehensive and nuanced view. With we have a five minute warning, I'm sorry. Okay. With these ideas, we'll put together a curriculum to explore these essential questions. What are AI machine learning and text mining? How do human classify text versus how computers do that? What are, how our words are turned into features and how do computer learn from data and how to detect and fix errors in machine learning models. And as I mentioned, we're a very young project. We're currently conducting uh, lab testing and we'll go into classroom testing next fall. And by the summer next year, we'll have the curriculum for broad dissemination. For now, we would like to show a short video of our technology prototype and Dr. Rose will highlight some of the key design features. Yes, I just wanted to point out that this, uh, this demo is to really show you some of the affordances of the CODAP platform that we can use to engage kids in the processes that Jay has outlined, but the structure of what the actual activities are that the students will do is still part of our active research. So take this as a representation of the nature of the engagement that we plan to offer kids. In the StoryCube project, we use free browser-based software called CODAP for data exploration. In CODAP, we embed a plugin that is capable of doing text analysis. Right now, it has only limited features and a not very friendly interface. This will change as we get more data from students and teachers. Here are 16 statements about food. Each statement has been labeled by a human with like or dislike. It's a very small data set, but we can still use it to see some interesting things about how text analysis works. We want to use these data to train a model so that it can assign labels itself, making use of the words that appear in these statements. Words that appear in at least four different statements will be counted as features in the model. Let's go ahead and do it. Here, in this predicted label column, we see that when StoryQ applied its model to these statements, it got them mostly right, but not completely. Here's one the human labeled like, but the model labeled dislike. By making a graph, we can get a better view of what the trained model did when applied to the training data itself. Let's put the human label here and the predicted label here. Each point represents a statement. The dots in these two quadrants contain the statements for which the model's label matched the human's label. And these two quadrants hold statements for which the labels didn't match. Let's look at these two statements. The human labeled these two statements like, but the model labeled them dislike. Here, the bold underlined words in the statement are the features the model is paying attention to because they appeared in at least four statements. You might guess that the word gross confused the model because the human labeled the other statements in which it appears dislike. Let's delve a little bit into how this works. In this table, we have a list of the seven features identified as appearing in at least four statements. In building its model, StoryQ assigns a weight to each of these. In predicting a label, StoryQ finds the features in the statement and combines their weights together. Positive weights push toward a positive label and negative weights push toward a negative label. If we click, click on the feature favorite, which has a positive weight, we see that it always predicts 
a positive label, but there is one wrong prediction, probably because this model has no way to incorporate the word not in not my favorite. We have a, in the start, a one minute warning. In the, free browser the important thing here is the role of the developer. We want to engage kids in the trade-off process, understanding the challenges of developing AI so that they realize that AI is not some ominous force out there, but it's, it's like a material that they are fashioning to play its role in the world as they are taking up that responsibility for pushing it forward. Thank you so much. Um, if you guys have, I don't know, any questions towards the end, maybe um, I'm happy to stay a little longer. Um, but with that, um, I'm going to introduce our last speaker for today. Um, Karen Weber and Stacey Wood from Microsoft, they're going to be talking to us about foreign beats and student kids. So please take it away. Okay. Hopefully everybody can hear me and see my screen. Stacy and I are from Microsoft and we're here to talk today about Farm Beats for Students, a precision agriculture experience for home and school. You know, we ask this question often of what are all those new skills that students need to learn? And when we think about that split, at least in the state of Washington for the class of 2021, 15 of those credits no one's gonna disagree with are actually knowledge academics. We know that they need history, literature, and social studies, sciences, and math. The real question is where are we putting all these new skills into that nine credit um, applied skills bucket? And that's a lot of skills to be able to try and figure out how to balance. And so we've taken an approach which is like STEM is a smoothie. And for the last two, five years, I've been working on a program called Hacking STEM, which looks at both data science and uh, engineering and in the next generation science standards to enable students to do hands-on learning and have data experiences that lead them um, into real life experiences. The day before the lockout, lockdown and we all got sent home, my team actually was able to host an amazing connection to an international space station where 250 kids came in and asked questions and interacted with Jessica Mears. And in doing so, they built little um, foot socks or astro socks to measure the pressure and force on their feet um, and to be able to then test that against what Jessica Mears was doing in space. This is run off of a program in Excel called Data Streamer and it's free and there are 25 lesson plans. Go check out the, the web page if you're interested in data and engineering projects. But we also have another set of projects at Microsoft which are really at the commercial level looking at AI. One of those projects is Farm Beats, and they're actually looking at deploying precision agriculture techniques um, around the world with farmers and pr food producers using both AI and uh, TV white space to support um, um, the connection and inactivity. That team in tw 2019 developed a kit called Farm Beats for Students Kit. You might have seen the video um, when, uh, attached to our uh, uh, website. And what was interesting is when we gave this to a set of agricultural educators at the FFA, Future Farmers of America. The kit was way too hard to use. It was actually way too hard for the, them to use at a hackathon with Microsoft engineers around supporting them. And it became very clear that in order to do this, we would actually have to step back and take a look at what you would really need to make this content and this experience accessible to students. So with the FFA, we went through and did a really interesting study and realized that we could make something for high school students. It couldn't just be easy to use, it had to be really easy to use. It should be able to be a no-code solution. We should be able to provide um, classroom curriculum that unboxed the concepts, and we could focus on data and data analysis. So our goal became empower every learner to apply AI to solve a real world problem while also introducing basic AI and data literacy. And we chose to, to fo focus on food and sustainability and to try and figure out how we could support the, the sustainable development goal number two. 
to start, we then went and modeled the concept and took it to the FFA and, and partnered with students to understand not only what they knew about this world, but also what could they do with it. And it was fascinating. Our little prototype, we built three little greenhouses, we sensorized it, and we asked the question, where in the world would it be best to, to grow chard in October? The most interesting thing is when we had the students then look at that and then get, build their own, their ideas were phenomenal. One woman wanted to make only pink hydrangeas for Valentine's Day, and so she would want to monitor the nitrogen. One student wanted to actually save lives in grain elevators, and so they would monitor those with um, uh, microphones. Another student wanted to preserve hams and make sure no mold was growing, and so being able to check that temperature. The stories the students had were phenomenal. Their ability to actually see how to apply that technology was stellar. But what was really interesting was when we first asked them, there was a great disparity in literature and literacy. Some students were saying, yeah, I know exactly what sensors are, and they'd pull out an app and show us what their father or mother's farms were doing. And some kids, we had to stop back and step back and say, you know, when you step on that, that mat at the grocery store and the door opens, there is a trigger, there is a sensor. And so that, that disparity in literacy was really interesting. The second thing is, is the absolute universal lack of uh, internet was something that made the students very nervous and had, had, was a great challenge. And this is pre-COVID and obviously then the economic barriers to entry. So we stepped back and we actually partnered with um, the FFA and CASE and we took the five big ideas and we designed a, a, a solution that we thought would actually work in the classroom. High school education curriculum focused on food and sustainability with hardware and software to re represent collecting data, machine learning, and agents to be able to show how you could apply those things, co-authored by this amazing group of people built on the five big ideas. The snapshot of the standards that we've been able to actually apply to this curriculum has been pretty amazing. Both the AF and our common career technical standards, plus NGS, CSTA, and even a little bit of math, all aligned to the five big ideas. And what we have today is a set of activities that students will learn how sensors can collect and store data. They will construct an agent to react to soil conditions. They will use multiple big data sets to extract intelligence about the best locations for greenhouses. And finally, students will create and train machine models to predict plant health based on leaf color and identify pests and intruders. And in doing that, we provide student experiences using Microsoft Excel and Loeb. We have a whole complete set of curriculum and resources, and we've partnered with SEED to build a, a kit that comes packaged with all the bits and bobs that you would actually need to pull this off. We've taken the five big ideas and used that as our framework and then aligned up these core courses that then integrate not only the agricultural experience, but the digital experience and the technical concepts. And so that while you may not actually connect to the cloud and use containers, you understand that that's what's happening, but you can do a lot of these things on a local basis. And that ability, and for us, it was really interesting, is how do we take these core framework of the five big ideas and make that the heart of the curriculum and insert the rest of this curriculum in? And so when the students are in their garden, they're planting seeds, they're, they're doing growing degree units, they're taking their readings, they're detecting pests. At the same time, they're actually understanding future ways of doing that, whether it's computer visions, face prints, speech recognition, or text, or on the other end, understanding that perception is um, more than just sensors, there's lots of ways of being able to perceive the world. We have a fun um, warning. Thank you. So here's a quick video to give you an idea of the program yeah, overview. Today's farms are beginning to look a lot more like smart cities. Digital signals connect people to each other, to the cloud, and to data. Growers are using multiple sensors to collect a more complete view of their crops. Their insights drive decisions like turning on irrigation systems, indicating where fertilizer should be applied, and predicting crop yields based on weather patterns. By applying computer vision and artificial intelligence, growers are seeing their crops in new ways, which helps them with crop monitoring, discovering inefficiencies, and unlocking new insights to improve food production. 
the Farm Beats for Students program brings these modern tools into the hands of today's learners. The Affordable Hardware Kit and Curriculum is designed to give students hands-on experiences in applying digital techniques to food production. Using an array of sensors that measure soil moisture, light, humidity, and temperature, students can stream, visualize, and analyze data in Excel. Additionally, working with curated data collections provides them with first-hand experience using the power that big data can bring to gaining insights into food production. Students can also build, train, and apply custom deep learning models to help track and inform plant health. Using the low application, students experience how computer vision is changing how we literally see data. Farm Beats for Students is designed to introduce every learner to the concepts of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science. By focusing on growing food, students can begin to easily see the connections between using modern tools and the jobs to be done. Farm Beats for Students is designed to provide access and understanding to the data-driven agricultural techniques that are rapidly changing the way the land is being worked and the way the land will work for us in the future. So what we've put together is a whole beautiful collection of Quick Start Educator resources. They are 20 sessions, 45 minutes each. Obviously, um, we aren't expecting educators to take this you know, lock, stock, and barrel. Our hope is that they come in and literally smorgasbord this and buffet and take the best that they want. If you want the course as a complete course, it is goes through and it has to have the complete pathway. We have the hardware build instructions. There are student activities. There are beautiful lecture PowerPoints and teacher notes for both on the technology on the ag ed side. And then obviously the Excel data streamer and these custom workbooks. All of these resources are there. They're free and um, available for educators. So to give you an example, the other thing that we've done is really looked at Big Idea 5. And I mentioned this yesterday is, you know, um, Microsoft, every one of our employees has had to go through this training. And we've been able to get those resources that all the Microsoft have, um, re, uh, employees have been trained with and make those available to include in this. What's beautiful about it is that there are Microsoft technical experts on ethics and AI who are actually presenting these, these five, six big ideas, um, fairness, reliability, privacy, safety, and inclusiveness, transparency, accountable, accountability. And they're actually complemented by a set of PowerPoints, for example, that lead to our articles to, to have discussions in your classroom. So that's a good example of one of the PowerPoint slides um, that PowerPoint collections that are in our educator resources. I'm going to end by saying there's an opportunity for you all to be able to try this out. We are just about to go into our pilot phase. We have about 500 educators that are starting to start to think about this. Today, I can actually uh, offer one box per state. If there are more interests, let us know. We can see what we can do. And this curriculum will actually launch on March 4th um, as part of World Engineering uh, Day for Sustainable Development. So what you're seeing here is a new preview um, of something that's going to come out in just a couple of weeks. If there's time, I can take a question. Karen, I, I am flabbergasted. I, we just got a huge grant from the National Science Foundation, the state of Illinois did. We're building, I just sent you a note on this, we're developing a, a very large AI system uh, to look at different practices. And this is more at the professional corporate level. But what we're trying to figure out is how do we keep a, create a pipeline for kids to get involved in this. I think this is just it is mind numbing. So I know right now we would love to have a conversation with you. And I, my last piece is we are also, I'm working with a teacher from the Global Teacher Prize to replant 60 million trees in Malawi. And we're also doing farm ground there. And that's one of the things we're trying to figure out is how do we use this type of technology to measure progress because the funding is so difficult to come up with to put the product in the ground. If we had this to help us make intelligent solutions, I, I, I just think it's a game changer. So to thank you for what you guys are doing and we would love to be a part of it. Well, okay, you get a kit. <laughs> you, get a kit. you get a kit. Um, I love Oprah I need, and I, I need, love Microsoft. I need a, con a kit too, thank you. Yes, how, how do we go about requesting a kit? Okay, so you can see Stacy's um, email on the bottom. 
Um, we put this in here. We actually are, um, if you go to this Farm Beats link right now, you'll get our deck um, because we're kind of holding it back. But we want to give the states as much opportunity as possible. So please let us know. Reach out to Stacy. Um, when you see these on the, the, the web, Stacy's email will not be there, but we really want you know, the states to have first dib at this. And most importantly, we want you to hack our curriculum. I can't say that enough. What we've done is we think is bootstrapped and giving you, you enough to get your teachers started. You can do PD with what we have and help them actually scaffold to be ready to teach this. But the important piece is, is that everybody else is starting from scratch. Take these materials, make them yours, make them fit your state, make them fit your kids. If you want to make this an engineering class, go make the kids go build the waterproof encasement. That plus the hardware would give them enough to know there. If you want to make this, you know, an AP capstone class for environmental um, course, take that and do that as the last 14 weeks. But think about how you can really slice and dice this and make this your own. And that's really our request. Um, and with the only cost to the states actually being kits that you would then have to use, and they're reusable anyway, because they all have Raspberry Pis in them. Any other questions if I have time? I'll like stop sharing my slides. Um, thank you so much, everybody. This concludes this um, session. Um, and I'm happy to stay behind and just chat um, I feel like we have really interesting conversations. So if you want to leave, you're welcome to leave. If you want to stay and have a chat with um, the people in the um, work, in the workshop, in the panel, in the workshop, please let me know. Um, I will stay here and I'm happy to do that.